So today we are going to do our labs on multilinear regression, regression in many variables. That is one of the topics for today. Besides that, we will also do univariate regression on a real world data set, the old faithful geyser in the Yellowstone National Park in US. I'll give you guys a background on it. It is the Yellowstone National Park. And for those of you uh, who are not familiar with it, which I think most of you are, but yeah, it is a geoth it's a geologically or geothermally active region. It's a volcanic, live volcanic sort of a, a lot of uh, plate teutonic activities happen there. And there's always the, there's supposed to be the molten lava just sort of below the surface or about to erupt or something like that. It's very, very active region geothermally. One of the features of that region is that you have these geysers. Um, geysers are this water shooting out of the ground to great heights for some time. Think of it as a pr pressure cooker valve um, when inside the water pressure is high, just shoots out through these geysers. The geyser runs for some time, let's say about 20 minutes or five minutes or whatever it is. And after that, as the pressure, pressure releases itself, the geyser will quieten down and stay quiet for some duration. And then it will again erupt. The old faithful geyser gets, it name, gets its name from the fact that for many, many decades, it has been faithfully erupting every approximately an hour. It is within 40 minutes to two hours. Um, it erupts. Now, the waiting time for the next eruption is dependent upon how long the previous eruption was. Sort of makes sense to a, from a physicist perspective, physics perspective. If a geyser has been, act, has been running for quite some time, a lot of pressure is released. And so it takes longer to build a pressure and the next eruption to happen. So in this data set, we'll have one predictor which is the duration of the last eruption. And what you have to predict is how long you have to wait till the next one. And the waiting time is the predictor for the next one. But the reason I bring it up is sort of univariate. We did a lot of very hard data sets. In real life data sets, I was somewhat simpler. And uh, we are going to use this as an example uh, of one of the data sets. So this is the old faithful geyser, if you're looking at my screen. Um, is uh, we can't. Or not yeah, no, okay, we then. can't see your screen. And I think did I did I remember to do the YouTube thing? Oh yes, I, I did that YouTube thing. Okay, so um, let me share. That is it. Now are we sharing the geyser picture on my screen? Yep. Yes. So this is it. This is artistic rendering of other guys. Right? So you can see this water shooting off to great heights. One of the great features, and of course, uh, in US, everybody knows about the Yellowstone National Park. It's one of the most magnificent national parks. Uh, so worth visiting. So I, I will load this. So this notebook is actually now increase the font size and uh, go, sorry. And go one more time. Okay, there you go. And uh, there we go. So this data is it readable now to everyone, guys, on your screens? Considering that we are a live streaming, could be made a little bit, a little uh, bit larger. larger. Yeah. Okay. There we go. So this data is very simple. We have eruptions. This is the duration of the eruption, I presume in minutes, and how long you have to wait for the next eruption. Those of you who are in California, you probably know that we have our old faithful guys are here also in Bay Area, in Calistoga, Napa, Napa Calistoga area. Uh, it's very, very nice actually. Kids totally enjoy it if you have young kids to go to. 
So the eruptions, of course, are not as long. They take three, four, five minutes. And then you have to wait for some time for the next one. You can clearly see that if the eruptions are long, you have a longer time to wait. If eruptions are short, you have less than an hour to wait, right? So this is the nature of the data. Now, some of the best practices that we have been developing along the way, I will assume hereafter that we always do. One of the things we learned is it is a good idea to use a scalar of the data. And standard scalar is quite effective if you don't have outliers in the data. So you can verify that this, does, this data set doesn't have outliers, actually. We'll see it in a moment. We scale the data. We look at its descriptions and so on and so forth, its eruption. Uh, when do you scale the data, like after doing history analysis or just yes, see, starting with the scaling? No, no, no. You should always look at the histograms before deciding on the scalar. So here I have not done because, uh, yeah, so this data set, do you notice that I have it here, right? Um, I have not taken the time to do a lot of uh, uh, it's cyclic. I should have plotted this figure before doing the standardization. So what happened is that I knew, I'm so familiar with this data. So I've done it sort of backwards. I standardized it, but I should probably have waited to do a data visualization before standardizing. So if you look at the data standardization, even it will not change the shape of the picture. It will just change the X, Y axis. So because I standardized the data, you notice that the mean is around zero. It is not very clear, but the standard deviation is one and it will show up in a little bit. So what do you notice that there is one cluster of values here and one cluster of values here, right? So, so you have either short bursts or long bursts of the old fight faithful guys, right? It erupts for pretty much two like uh, groups of eruptions, short and long. If you notice that, and you can see it when once you standardize the data, what do you expect the mean to be? Zero. And so it is 5.15 into 10 to the minus 16. Practically, that's the definition of zero because in floating points, it's almost never do you get zero. Uh, standard deviation up to three decimal, two, three decimal, two decimal place at least is one, right? So the data has been standardized. There are no null values in the data. If you plot it, it looks like this. You can see two groups. So later on, when you learn about clustering, we will do clustering on this data too, right? So you'll get two clusters, one for short eruptions and one for long eruptions. Then today I'd like to introduce this very useful plot. These are called the pair plots. The two variables, eruption and waiting, what it happens is this, is this is pretty much the histogram that we were looking at, except that uh, the word for that is called kernel density plots, kernel density estimator plots. What it means is, I'll give you an intuition of it. Kernel, kernel densities and kernels are things we will cover in great detail when we do the neighborhood methods. The word kernel is very central actually to a lot of things we'll do. But so, since we haven't done that, is that a kernel function or is that a it is the same thing. Yeah. It is so one year, this is the intuition I'm giving. The intuition is if if it wasn't just this few hundred rows of data, what if the data was asymptotically infinite? Uh, then what would be the distribution that you would see? density estimation or density distribution. So kernel density estimation is essentially that intuition. It estimates that distribution function, which would have been there, assuming that the data set was very, very large, how the histogram would have looked. Histogram would have looked like this, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, with finite data, it is an estimation of that. It's a continuous, continuous curve. That's why it's called kernel density, uh, a probability function that estimates or sort of uh, how much that will be. So how does it extrapolate? Some ways it's trying to extrapolate, right? Yes, it does. And we'll learn about that. We, what happens is uh, the kernel here, typically these are um, Gaussian oh. kernels. How do you fit these and right. put them together? Right. We'll learn about it in the neighborhood methods we'll do. But but while that topic will come, it's not that hard. See, you notice that this picture here, right? Yes. 
uh, you can see in the two dimensional variable in the two dimensional space the contour plots right of equal density. So this is it, it's a, it's a beautiful concept. At this moment, I thought whether to introduce or not, and I thought I'll introduce it because it's just such an important visualization. It's good to introduce it early, okay? The, the top right hand is of course the, the scatter plot. We are all familiar with. This is the wait time, eruption time. As you can see, they are bimodal distributions, short, long, short, long. So, and when you look at the contour plots, you can literally see the two clusters form here. So it gives you an insight into the data. Now let's build a regression model where eruptions, like how long did this eruption last? And uh, is the predictor and the target variable is how long do I need to wait? If, I, if I've seen an eruption of five minutes or four minutes, now how long do, do you, should I wait? By the way, it's really very, uh, <laughs> when you take your children's example here to Calistoga, the first thing your kids will do is they will watch the, with great excitement, they'll watch the eruption. And then the very next question they'll ask you is, okay, when do I get to see the next one, right? So, well, this is going to answer exactly that question. So by now you should be familiar with it. We built a linear regression model. A question? Yes. Is the other way also the thing holds true? Like if I wait for this long, can I predict like how yes. I will go, right? So yes, yes, of course. So why an X and X and Y? Right? How long the next, um, that is a good thing. Why, why don't you do that? But I think people haven't gathered the data this way, that if I see the eruption, if I wait certain time, right. how long is the next eruption? Right. I don't know whether this data is sequential. If it is, then you can use it. You'll have to look into the original source of the data. If that is true, then that could be another good analysis to do. It's a good idea. Right, yeah. Uh, looking over time, but yeah. So look into the source of the data, whether it's sequentially given or not. So building a regression model by now, guys, you would all agree that this line of code is pretty easy and straightforward for you to get. On this big screen, is it coming out legible from the back row? Uh, Premjit, are you able to see the code clearly? I'm looking at my computer. Oh, you guys are looking at your computer. Okay, yes. But but on this monitor, is it big enough or do I need a bigger monitor? No, you need to make it bigger. I do need to make it bigger. Okay. It's what about now? now? This is perfect. Yeah. This is perfect. Okay. So look at the screen then uh, so that I can see, see your faces. Here we go. So we this model, I hope you would agree, is straightforward. Then we build a prediction model. By now, this is also very... So one new thing I wanted to tell you. See, whenever you are predicting, typically we look at mean squared error, which is good, but sometimes the root mean squared error is more intuitive, right? So suppose somebody says that the house price was 4,000 and your root mean squared error is 100. You know, this pretty accurate estimation of the house price, right? So that way it is uh, good to know what the root mean squared error is. So, uh, and the way you do that square, root mean squared is set squared is equal to false. If you set squared is equal to false in the mean squared error function, it will get that. So let's look at the residual analysis. What do you say guys in the residuals? Do you find any uh, choice? Do you see homoscedasticity or heteroscedasticity? Homos. Homoscedasticity, isn't it? You don't see the variance of the residuals change as you move from left to right, right? Move along the x-axis. So there is a rough homoscedasticity. So this looks encouraging. What about the distribution of the errors? Is there any skew in the distribution of the residuals on the side? No pronounced skew, right? Very modest, if any, skew. And you can do that by computing the skew, but I'll, I'll leave you to visually just inspect and say, yes, there isn't much skew. So let us now, what is the final thing we do? We visualize the model predictions, isn't it? Especially with one dimensional data, it's easy to do. So there we go. 
And these are your predictions. So is this a good model? It is. I leave a homework for you. And what is the R squared, by the way, that we got? Uh, do we remember? 76%. 76% is, is it good or bad? Okay. Yeah. When you look at the data, you know, you, you have to tone your expectations. The data is like this. So there are things that you don't know, right? The geoth geoth geothermal activity, which are actually contributing to it, and you have no access to those variables. So this is the best you can do with this. So it's a pretty good model, and you can verify that. Try building, a, and these things, I don't know, guys, uh, take this homework seriously, because when you do that, a polynomial regression, you have the code. You can try it out in five minutes. Try it out. See, does it give you a better model? And then ask yourself, should it give you a better model? Right? So uh, leave that as an exercise for you. So this is the old faithful guy, sir. So, one quick question here. Yeah. So there's also another possibility that happens earlier. Let's hold that in Yeah. Uh, so I'm projecting a little from this visual to frame my question. Right? There's a possibility that there's a structural change in the data, right? For a moment, let's assume the lower cluster had a different gradient compared to the higher cluster. If you were to fit a single line through them, yes, very good question. Bad, but if you fit two separate single lines, that is right. They would be good. That is right. We haven't discussed an inference. We haven't. How to find that? What? How to treat that? Yeah. So the thing is, when you do polynomial, because it gives you the ability to flex. It can actually come up with different slopes in different regions. Try doing that. But so more. A single polynomial will actually fit it reasonably. Do, well. Yeah, it will do. As but there is. To identifying a split in the data and saying, yeah. let's fit two linear models. Yes. And then they have to join the two somewhere in between somehow. So those are called, and we will come to you. Remember, I said that the word kernel is an advanced topic we'll do later. Those are called kernel based regression models. That's what they do. That's one way of doing it. Another is to do something called spline, make local linear models and keep joining them. There is yet another way of doing it, which, which also we will do, again, to do with kernel uh, methods. It is called kernel nearest neighbor, and there are methods like LOIS. What you do is you look at local regions and you make tiny regression models in little patches, and then you stitch those patches together. When the data is highly nonlinear, that is effective. In fact, that old technique is called LOS. In geology, that was very, very often used. The word LOS comes from there. Okay. Right, sir. So there are many, many techniques we learn. Remember, this is the beginning of machine learning. We have another eight months to go. Right. So the, the comments on these uh, observations it reminds me of. Uh, uh, like actual sales and things mm -hmm. like that, which had that characteristic, like at different price ranges, yeah. you would have different factors across the cost price. Yeah. So, again, you could clearly see the distribution. Distribution. Yeah. The few million dollar houses, it was cool, nothing mattered. You yes. see how far you were away from the whole neighborhood. Versus with the lower ones, you could clearly see like number of bedrooms, those kind of things mattered. And over there, there's completely different factors. And they're structurally different. They're structurally and different. You see those gaps yeah. between one price range yeah. to the other. Yeah. So that was. No, this is a very good point you brought. Let me further elaborate. Uh, for those of you who are remote, Sachin brought up the point that the Zillow housing data shows pronounced non-linearities and different regions of the feature space, there are different kinds of activities or factors involved. This actually goes to the heart of machine learning. One of the things we will learn is real life is highly non-linear. And so most good predictive models, they are telling very different stories in different parts of the feature space. So the models are non-linear. And so when you ask which features matter, like people often say, if, if house, what, what determines house price? There is never one answer. The answer depends upon which price range, which geography, which part of the feature space are you looking at? Because there are different factors in play in different, and people know that, people who are in real estate, they will tell you that real estate is a very local market. 
the forces are very local. That is why local real estate, you know, there's no one global real estate yeah. company that, that has the answer to all problems, right? Or has perfect. They're all based on local real estate uh, intuition. And it's the nature of it. In diseases, everywhere it's true. For example, when you look at diabetes, if you ask in children, pediatrics, or up to age 15, what is the most common cause of diabetes? Those factors are completely different for what is most common cause of diabetes in people over 40, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the game changes. So even though we build one model, one of the, re, one of the answers to this question, why are most models non-linear, effective models non-linear? Because you need non-linearity to capture the fact that there are different realities in different parts of the feature space, right? And that's a big topic. In fact, that's where we are heading. Uh, in another two weeks, we like we are still in the linear world. In two, three weeks, four weeks actually, we'll be completely in the non-linear world, right? We have a lot of things to do, kernel methods, support vector machines, ensemble methods, boosting, bagging, forests, right? There is a, there is a, and then of course the neighborhood methods. There is a lot that we are going to do, but that will come in due course of time. But the good thing is one, the old faithful guys uh, I like because it's a very really neat, clean data set. It has a nice story to tell and very easy to analyze, isn't it? There's but, another data set uh, which I was, uh, which reminded me to take a look at is basically the fat, the correlation between the fat and the waste size. And what happens is that every waste size, so there is, as the waste size increases, the percentage of fat also increases. Mm -hmm. But there is a distribution at each one of them as its own uh, maxima and minimum. So okay. there's a distribution of people like at certain waste sizes, how much yeah. they spread. Okay. So that distribution itself has a nice, what you call, pattern in the distribution itself. Okay. So as people tend to have bigger waste, the fat side of it starts to dominate. Okay. Versus yes. the thinner waste, the the distribution of fat it basically becomes like pretty normal. Yes. In the sense that it's muscle and it's, it's a very interesting uh, data set. I can speak from personal experience. <laughs> 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 All right, guys. So, uh, with that, uh, uh, so let me. Uh, so, if we look at just the visualization of this data set. Yes. Uh, if we no, not this here, the other one. At the end. Yeah, so if we look at the way the distribution is, and if you also look at the residual plot, it kind of, even though residual looks random. Yeah. But the, from the distribution perspective, it is. Yes, 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 that's right. I mean, you can imagine these little residuals falling off this, and you can see that that is what the other plot is showing. Yes, yeah, so that's why you're yeah. dealing with the polynomial Yeah. So try this out. So, guys, now that we have the geyser, remember that here, life was very simple. How did we build a model? Building the model for us was model.fit, linear regressor, mod regression, model.fit. So this is, we are using a library, scikit-learn library. And in real life, you often use libraries, but then it is also true that you need to learn how to do without libraries, just from first principles. How would you, how would you do the learning? We learned all this theory about uh, gradient descent and so on and so forth. So what does it mean for us to do this by hand? So we are going to do the same data set simple geyser data set, but this time around, we will use gradient descent, right? So I do the basic stuff here, things that you're familiar with. Um, here, the same data set, I use it, scale it, and so on and so forth. The same eruptions, mean is zero, standard deviation is close to one. Guys, do you see it? Yeah. Right, and now, yes, uh, one of the things that I do is, uh, so these little tricks, you know, you'll see me continuously introduce little tricks here. Yeah, what happened? This table became, do you see that this pandas table, data frame table, now looks a little bit more interactive. 
Did you see the difference, guys, compared to this? Yeah. I put some color here and so forth. So that you can do by adding a style. I've added a little bit of CSS style to this table. How I've done it, you can see, uh, and I'll leave that as an exercise for you to go and look at support vectors common uh, notebook, how I, you can do styles. Of course, you should have your own styles. My style, I prefer these colors, which are off colors. Typical corporate styles are blue, but I spend my whole day in corporate world and all I look at is blue, different shades of blue. So I don't feel like looking at that anymore. So I've made all of support vector colors, anything but blue. Well, there is the blue, but this blue is midnight blue. It's supposed to be in the color spectrum compatible with it. So, well, okay, here it is. Mostly reddish, I like salmon color. This is the scatter plot of that you're familiar with. This is the eruptions waiting time. Again, you're familiar with, this is just a recap. So now let's go to gradient descent. The beta, next value of the parameter is the beta's current value times this, right? This is, a, uh, this is just a recap. We will just take the simple unregularized uh, regression, a simple linear regression, some squared error is enough. Then if you just work out, it is some squared error. When you take the gradient of the loss function, which is this with each of the parameters, if you work it out, you can see that it works out to this, almost literally from here to here, you can see it if you're good with your calculus. Immediately you see it. Right? Do you agree that uh, the, the partial derivatives with respect to beta naught and beta one come to these two things? I'll give you I'll give you a few seconds to absorb it and agree that that's obvious. Do you see that, guys? Yes. That's right. So we move forward. And so when you plug it into this, these values into the equation here, this equation, what it leads to is this. All we need to do now is to run the gradient descent. Now gradient descent, we, we will define, we will start with the learning rate, which is very small. Actually here I read 10 to the minus five, but that becomes too slow a learning too small learning in a single step. I wanted it to be a little bit faster. So I made it 10 to the minus four here. Also, typically beta naught, beta one, you start with some random values. So what you should do is remove my four minus four and start with some random values. When you start with some random values, then it will gradient descend. Now for reasons of data visualization, because you will see a plot that I visualize here, uh, I have deliberately started in such a way that the plot that it will draw will bring the intuition out for you. So I deliberately forced it to start at this point, but for no rhyme or reason, just for visualization perspective. Now we need to discuss a concept called epoch. In machine learning, during the learning phase, we define an epoch is one, com one journey through the complete data set. Are we together? When you have visited every point in the data set, you, you have completed an epoch. Now in the gradient descent step, if you look, do you notice that we sum over every single point at each step? If you look at this, sorry, look at this, uh, we, we sum over every point when we do the next step. So what does it mean? At each step, we complete an epoch. For the training data. In the training data, yeah. For every, because in each step, we are, we are computing the gradient by summing over the, the errors of each of the, the residuals of each of the data points. Therefore, one step of gradient descent is one epoch. Now, there are many kinds of gradient descent. What I've been calling gradient descent in the more formal language would be called batch gradient descent. A batch gradient descent is a descent in which the entire data set is one batch. The opposite of that is stochastic gradient descent in stochastic gradient descent, one step is just one data point. You don't have a summation here. Summation is missing. You just learn from one point and its mistakes. And then there in between, there is a method in between that doesn't do, th these two are extremes to take the entire data set or learn from one step learning is from only one point. The alternative is to learn from small batches of points. 
those are called mini batch. So suppose you have 300 points, you will create mini batches of let's say 16 points each, right? And then, so then your uh, each step will compute the loss from 16 points. Next step will compute the loss from 16 points and it will learn from that. So there's a lot of learning by the time you run through the whole epoch, right? Approximately 20 steps you would have taken to learn through about 300, uh, maybe 19 steps you would have taken to learn through um, those 300 odd points, right? If your mini batch size is 16. So there are many different va variants to gradient descent. The one that we will look at here is the very simple one. We sum over all the points, right? It is the so-called batch gradient descent, full batch. Now, this word is a little bit abused. The technical distinctions are batch, stochastic, and mini batch. But a lot of people, can, because of colloquialism, they, they will call mini batch as batch gradient descent, especially in the deep learning community. And it becomes rather confusing sometimes. But remember, this, these are the correct terminology. So now, whatever we wrote here, I will write, rewrite it in code. So I said alpha will be very small. I'm starting alpha as, what does this line possibly say? Alpha is equal to power 10 minus four. What, what do you think it does? 10 to the power minus four. Exactly, thank you. So it is alpha is 10 to the minus four. Then beta zero, beta one are the two parameters of a line, remember? Slope and intercept. I could start, I could take initial value to be any random thing, but I have deliberately taken four, four. That is for purely for visualization purpose. You should change this code. Your homework is to remove it and just actually initialize it randomly. Epox is 200. What does 200 say? We are going to take about 200 steps. Why? Because simple data set, 200 is already enough, right? It's a stopping criteria. You learn for 200 steps and stop. Now you break the data up into X and Y, which of course is straightforward. You break it up into the arrays. And then what are the values that you have to learn? So alpha is this, beta naught beta one is this. We are going to run 200, excuse me, epochs. Now what do I do? And this is the heart of it. This is the inner core of what we are going to do with the gradient descent. The first one, I just create a data frame in which at each epoch, I will store that whatever the value of beta naught beta when we have learned so far, I'll store those and I'll store the value of the loss function. Like how, what is the loss function? So what should happen as I go from epoch to epoch, I should see an improvement in the value of beta towards the final answer, betas, and I should see a decrease in the loss, isn't it? You wouldn't expect to see increase of the loss function, blowing it up you should see a decrease of the loss function, isn't it? Because after all, our loss surface is parabolic, isn't it? So it should see a decrease in the loss function. So let us now please pay attention to this loop. It is the crucial loop for each epoch and the number of epochs. So for 200 epochs, what do we do? Let's look at this step and tell me if it looks confusing. Compute the gradients. Here are the gradients. So you notice that this is sum over yi minus beta naught minus beta one times xi, right? Is this now, compare this to this statement, beta naught, the next step of beta naught is this, beta naught plus alpha, right? So no, no, first no, first the gradient. This is the gradient. Gradient is equal to minus, minus the sum of, y i minus beta i minus beta one, beta naught minus beta one x. Uh, please pay attention to this equation here. Is this exactly uh, what I have written in code uh, here? Go ahead, somebody has a question. Uh, so it's y i minus y i hat the whole square, right? So yes, pretty when much. You differentiate it, shouldn't there be a two in front multiple of? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I sort of. Uh, the loss, yes, that is a very good point. I sort of glossed over the constants, right? The, the point okay. is two, there, there should be a two here, but I have glossed over the constants, right? So okay. if you want to be very precise, we can change our loss function. Where is it? Least square is equal to sum over. So let me just make it like this. Um, frac one over two is equal to, once again, this frac. 
Okay, so let us be precise. Huh? Uh, like uh, people, when they're explaining, they tend to gloss over it. But why gloss over it? Okay, now are you feeling better? Look at this. I added a half here. So then when you take the gradient, that there won't be a two here. Okay. Right. Yeah. You okay. know, this, uh, this constants, one over n, one over two, these things, people tend to gloss or in the gradient, you can apply a two, but um, it won't affect the results basically. Okay. Okay. That is why you gloss over these things. But it is a good point, uh, good that you caught it. So compute the gradient. So we now have the gradient. Do you notice that this looks exactly what you thought? Minus sum over y i minus beta naught i minus beta one, beta one x one x i. Does this look intuitive, guys? Anybody? Does it feel intuitive? This statement in view of this statement here. Look at this. Minus sum over this quantity. Yes. If you're not understanding it, let me know because I have written it in such a way that the code is almost identical to the math. Yeah. Likewise, the partial derivative with respect to beta one, a d beta here, I mean, uh, log, gradient of the loss with respect to beta naught. Right? Yeah. This will tell us if x and y, the cardinality is different, right? It basically makes the Cartesian pair of- Yes, ones. yes. Yeah, basically zips is like a zipper. No, one, one from this side, one from this side, one from- If the, if the cardinality is different, it will go different. It will, it will give you. I don't know whether it will throw an error. It, I think it will stop at the shorter one. But check it out, it's a good question. I mean, the best thing is to do a tiny experiment and see what happens. So there we go. Now, the next step is once you have, look at this equation. Once we have the gradients, you can take the gradient descent step. This is the gradient descent step, right? So let's go take the gradient descent step. Here it is. A gradient descent step beta naught is beta. Next value is beta naught's current value minus alpha times gradient of the loss. Like this, this equation, guys. I hope this is pretty self-evident, right? This is the this is literally the definition of the gradient descent, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So this is it. And then after that, what do we do? Now that we have new values for beta naught and beta one, we can go compute the new loss. What is the loss now that we have improved values of beta naught, beta one? Okay. What is the loss here? And we store all of it in our table. This intermediate stable, intermediate values table, which we can see what it is. By the way, whenever you have a table to display with floating points, it can be very annoying. You can get values till five, six, seven, eight decimal points and it becomes messy. So it is a good idea to contain the precision, limit the precision to a, to a sensible value. Three digits is more than enough for us to do. So I put the precision here for three digits. So it's your choice. You can make it two, four, whatever it is. Now, do you notice that beta naught starts out with close to four, but then it gravitates towards zero. Isn't it? Do you notice that beta naught gravitates to close to zero and beta one gravitates to 0 0.9, according to our learning. Now, what did scikit-learn have to say? Let's go and see what did scikit-learn have to say when we did that. Do you remember what was the parameter? What was the beta naught, beta one we found? Look at this. Does it agree with this? Beta naught, is it? Pretty much beta naught here is 0 0.012. And what we found is beta naught is 0 0.016. If we had run it for another few hundred epochs, it would have converged there, right? And slope is 0 0.9168. And what are we getting? Slope is 0 0.913. Means I took, I stopped at 200 epoch. I'll give you a, thing guys, run it for 400 epoch. See if the two answers begin to match. But do you notice how easy it is that you can do the gradient descent quite literally the inner workings 
by hand. You don't need to uh, use a library. And as I said, it's good to develop this practice because as you get to more advanced topics, you will be doing it by hand. So let us here plot this. Do you notice that the beta naught values gravitate to its final answer from four? Beta one also gravitates to its final answer. What is the final answer for beta naught? It is, what do you see here, guys, in the graph? Beta naught's final answer is? Zero, Just around zero. And beta one's final answer is this, this thing, close to 0 0.9. Yeah. Right? This is it, as you expect. What about the loss function? Learning is proper only when you see the loss function go down. But what if it starts going back up? You're in trouble. Right? Or some strange thing happens, you're in trouble. So here, is the loss function going down steadily? Yes. No. So here I took alpha is equal to 10 to the minus 4. What do you think would have happened if I took alpha is equal to 1? I will leave that big steps, big steps of learning. I'll leave that as an exercise for you to figure out. Right? Uh, I mean, we can run it right now. You, if you guys have downloaded the code, you can run it right now and see what happens. But I want you to do it yourself and see what happens. Now, now I'll plot the contour surfaces. Remember I told you that in the parameter space, in the hypothesis space, the, the error bowl, this error ball is projecting down to the hypothesis, beta naught, beta one space, parameter space, right? Or the, what I keep calling the hypothesis space. And there, what will be the projection of these ISO, the equal error curves here? They will be curves on this hypothesis space, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Right? So this is, those curves are called contour plots, right? Or contour surfaces. In the contour plot, you see these lines, of course, because we are dealing with a two dimension, so these are lines, more broadly, there will be curves, there'll be surfaces. So these are the contour surfaces on, the, on this plane, right? So I've drawn it out, all those, uh, this is real, by the way, this, this is actually from coming from the calculation we just did. Here. Because of the colors, did you link that to some parameter for those colors to happen like that? Yeah, so what you do is you typically pick a good color scheme. Where it is, is the default one, I believe. The, the closer you are in Veridis, right? Uh, the more reddish or violet, or um, is it violet? Or what, what color would you call the center? Violet. Violet, oh. violet, right? Violet, purple, whatever. And the outer, the outer you go, it goes through blue, green, finally yellow, right? So high values are yellow. No. And I have put the values also. Do you see that 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600? Yeah. Now you notice that it pretty much the error reaches the minimum error. Now, what is the minimum error we reach? Look at this. At 200 epochs, we are close to what is the error table showing? Uh, 52, approximately 51.3. Right? That is where the minima is achieved. And you can see that the minima is achieved pretty soon. Right? But there is a little bit more learning to do. You know, If you really look at it, the curve is still going down. So you can run another couple of hundred epochs and get the near perfect answer. But this is good enough for us. Uh, this is it because I wanted, I, I wrote the code in such a way that it will run on all your laptops. It, is, it shouldn't be that your laptop hangs and you have to go out for dinner before you can continue. So now we keep the alpha constant here. We keep it? the learning rate constant here. That is right. That is an important point. We keep the learning rate constant, which is not true when we do much more complex uh, regressions or complex classifications and so forth. You will see that we, uh, what you do with learning is a whole subject in its own right. It is, is like a specialized bit of research in its own right. They're very, interesting and fascinating things people do on how they change the learning rate as you learn, right? And there's a lot going on there. There's all sorts of things like one-shot learning and this and that, and um, we, we'll talk about it when we get to the deep learning part. And now, the, now, remember, I keep talking of the bowl, physically my error surface bowl. How does it look in code? How does it look for the same uh, geyser data set? I visualize the code for you. Right? So what happens is, remember, we started at 4.4. We start here, and the learning happens 
with this point, you see the loss point going down, 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 down to the bottom of the bowl and its projection on the hypothesis plane. Do you see these points? And in the beginning, do you see that the loss is decreasing by big amounts? I deliberately put points to show that it is, it is like a rabbit that's hopping forward, big strides. And then the strides become slow. It starts creeping. The little rabbit turns into a tortoise, right? It's creeping forward towards the final answer, right? And um, the, the code is a little bit more involved. I mean, it needs understanding. There's nothing machine learning about it, but usually in this world, you'll realize that once you get the hang of machine learning, you'll start finding that you need to master data visualization, mm -hmm. which is a subject in its own right. And uh, believe it or not, like you may, you may dismiss it and say, hey, that's not intellectually challenging. Actually it is, you know why? Because a, a good data scientist, typical data scientists make I don't know, I'm giving you current figures in the Silicon Valley, uh, out of box 250. If you are also a data engineer and a data scientist and you're a full package, well, out of box half a million a year. If you are a data scientist and data engineer and a complete beautiful visualization guru, I happen to know from personal experience from some, some people who are doing it, can you guess what, where do they fall? 200, 300, 400, the outer box of right. COPS? Hmm? Easily, easily, easily three, four million. Three, four million. So what I'm trying to say is that guys, never, never underestimate the value of good visualization or beauty. In this field, right, mathematicians, they, it matters. Right? So one way that I say it uh, jocularly, don't take it too seriously. See, kids, when they play with crayon, right, we consider it normal. But as adults, we are not supposed to play with colors, isn't it? The only profession that lets you play with colors is, guess what? It is mathematics, isn't it? This is the only one where you see me writing in colored crayons on the, on the blackboard. If you're physically here, writing in color and on the digital blackboard here. And in the visualization, you can use a lot of colors judiciously. So guys, there is a, the visualization is profound. It can help make huge business decisions. I have seen it in reality. Florence Nightingale essentially founded the profession of nursing with one visualization from the cream, for, for, of fatalities in the Crimean War, right? And that tradition has continued. Uh, the, when we say that a picture is worth a thousand words, it's really true in the world of data, even more true. Because when you create models and you come up with insights, and if you can visualize that insight, it is worth a thousand words, right? So, so why don't you use this during your uh, talk when you actually teach this concept? Done. No, because then I can't do dynamically, right? I can't draw the surface and draw lines, no, no, etc. Yes, line. I could have done that. I could have. I tend not to use pre-prepared material because I feel that learning should be spontaneous uh -huh. and it should be in the flow of conversation. So to preserve, it's a it's a basic educational philosophy for me. Uh -huh. So to keep it in the flow of thing. See, I have seen a lot of material, and all uh -huh. that material is dazzling, and right. I can create dazzling right. material. Right. The trouble with dazzling material is we get dazzled, yeah. whereas learning takes place best in the flow of conversation with almost no devices. Right. right. So when you when your younger brother says, explain something to me over a dinner table, you may at most have a pencil and paper in hand. But that explanation is gold compared to watching elaborate presentations on the Internet. Mm -hmm. So that is a, that that was one of the great insights. For example, Khan, mm -hmm. Salman Khan. Right. Before that, a, online education was all about well choreographed videos. I mean, it was always becoming like Hollywood. If you go back right. and look at some of the Linda learning or uh, right. LinkedIn learning now, uh, they uh, or India Bayou, right? Yeah, uh, they, they are very successful. There's no doubt about it. But it's a different educational philosophy. There, each of the videos is there is a subject matter expert who tells you what to say, uh, right? There is actually a choreography team there. There is an actor who will voice over the instructor who will literally master that script 
and he's not a subject matter expert, but will explain using the words the subject matter is given. And usually the person who is teaching, for example, if you go to bio sector, is generally young and pleasing looking, mm -hmm. making just the right gesticulations, mm -hmm. right? So the entire thing is very choreographed, but the trouble is you can't ask a question in between. Right. Isn't it? But Khan took the opposite approach, Salman Khan. He, he was just going to teach his niece, yeah. right? So he just took a little board and scribbled on it and right. started explaining that. And that turned out to be perhaps the most profound revolution in education of this century. Mm -hmm. It completely rewrote how learning, uh, online learning should be done. Right? And you can see the effects of that everywhere. Before that, before that, people used to do a lot of PowerPoints and so forth. But for example, if you look at Andrew Ng today, oh, yeah. even he does that. Occasionally, he will come up with formulas, but right. then he will doodle a lot all over it in yeah, the Khan yeah, Academies, yeah, yeah. in the Salman Khan style. Right, right? Right, right. Now, I have thought about bringing that. One reason I don't bring even uh, like Andrew Ng some things written is because I feel that it forces me into a structure that the and it prevents students from driving the conversation. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I'm in the classroom, I would rather that the students understanding or lack of it, the interruptions, the questions drive the converse, the agenda. In other words, don't come up with what you have to teach in a rigid form. Let the questions in the class create a flow of conversations and go with that, which is why I never really know what I will teach and how much I will teach mm -hmm. or where I will put depth in. Yeah, so that this, freedom I have. This curve, I remember I kind of plotted this like five, six years back mm -hmm. and using some the primitive whatever software was available that time. And it took me a hard time. I think I spent probably upwards of a week trying to yeah. you know, get it running, right? Mm -hmm. This but the part was this the amount of detail that you have put in this piece drives the home so so the, well, yeah. the, the thing so fast because I was planning to do this exactly mm -hmm. like my whole like last week I've been thinking of how to do it and now you have just shown it over here and I didn't know if during the class if you had done that if others would have appreciated or they would have got lost in just the beauty of this look that is it see one of the things we realize in research is education they're very active area and a lot of opinions and so forth and obviously i'm not an expert in education i my understanding of education is through 30 years of teaching postgraduates yeah, yeah, yeah. right uh, and 30 32 years now but um, and you learn a thing or two and i read a lot of books on education and research on education but i'm not a uh, formal expert in it. I'm an engineer and a scientist, right, 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 physicist, right? right? Uh, but um, my general experience has been, and the, and the body of research that I have read says, that two things you should avoid in education. Uh, whenever you're doing online or something, a, keep your face away from it, mm. right? Because human beings, the, the whole brain structure is designed in such a way that the moment it sees a face, especially the eyes, it latches onto that. Mm. And it just keeps looking. So remember, there, there were some videos which was using called light box. The guy would stand and write. It would look as though the person is writing on a glass mm -hmm. from behind the glass, yeah, and you yeah, see yes, the person. Yes, yes. A lot of videos were, it was, it is super impressive. But if you actually look at what people are paying attention to, they are paying attention to this guy yes, speaking. Through, through the glass. yeah, through this, yeah. because a human mind is deeply, deeply conditioned to look at faces. That's how we recognize danger. That's how we recognize emotion. We keep looking at faces. So the best way to teach actually is to take the face away. Like for example, when I'm teaching, I'm hoping, I don't know what you guys are seeing. What you're looking at is the code. And maybe in the top right-hand corner is my face somewhere, mm. but it's not dominant there, right? The, the second thing that you learn is that use colors judiciously principle of least ink. Use color, but use the least ink to express it. When you see this, how much ink there is. Right. 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 So it looks very pretty. It see, sometimes it's good. Like, for example, I believe that once you have seen those drawings, yeah. then to see this is very impressive. But to start with this, in my view, is not a good idea. Right. It's a better way yeah. to first do hand hand drawings yes, and yes. then finally come to this and not only come to this so this and by the way the code if you want to see is very simple yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah what i have done is i've plotted the surface right surface plot and what i have done is because see here the loss is only 53 right. so the 
error surface is practically sitting on the parameter space. The, the net residual is too small. So just to visualize, I lifted it up. I deliberately added 2,000 extra error points to error it point. to, to create the visualization. Wow. And then you play around with alpha, but then there is nothing else. Now the contour lines, these are the hand-driven contour, making sure that my contour lines should be at these values. And then the rest of it is very simple. The contour plot and the main plot, this is it. Two, three lines of code, and then you get, get it. It takes a little while to become good at plotting and 3D visualization, but you do. But then what you can do is, I've also given you, because I knew that some of you would want to do this on your own. Mm -hmm. So I have not only put the code, I, I gave you the code to make it into a movie. Mm. Right. So this code will make it into a movie with one point. Remember, I've said iteration to zero for safety. If you blindly run this notebook, you may accidentally end up running this bit of code. So to prevent it from being done, I've set the iterations to zero. Oh, I uh, change the comment this out and uncomment the next line out. Because when it runs on your laptop, unless you have a powerful laptop, it can easily run for a few hours. Making movies is always longer, right? right, right. right? So oh, ultimately right. it produces this movie. Let's try this. Right. Uh, I will start this. I will just decrease the, uh, just forgive me. So guys, pay attention. I'm going to start this, this uh, gradient descent spread. Uh, keep your uh, eyes on this point. Do you see where my mouse is? Mm -hmm. Keep your eyes there and see what happens. Hmm. Do you see the gradient descent taking place? Yeah. Right? And do you notice that as you come closer to the final, because at the bottom of the bowl, what happens? The, it's, the, it's not steep. The gradient is low. Yeah. So for a fixed learning rate, if the gradient is low, the steps you are taking are slow, right? So you go like a rabbit and then you start creeping like a turtle, yeah. like a tortoise. It was the final answer and there you are. Was it fun? Yeah. Right. Yeah, this so we a... have to re-download that lab. Oh yes, you have to re-download the lab. It is online though. Yeah, yeah the latest yeah. version is there, yeah. That's the difference. Come again. Oh, no, no, because my uh, teaching faculty, we reviewed this yesterday or day before, so they didn't have the latest version. They didn't have the movie there. Oh, okay. This little movie was there. That. I don't okay. know. Yeah. Yes. So this is it. So guys, do you see that the magic behind the theory that I taught you, right, is very real. You can literally code that theory into, code that theory and see it work, right? And uh, so that is that, that is one notebook. Let's take a five minutes break and then we'll go to the next data set, which is about pondering over the mysteries of whether high horsepower engine have low mileage or high mileage. <laughs>